That was a hard act to follow. So I, unfortunately, I'm, I'm going to read some of my uh, talk. I'm, I'm not quite as adept at public speaking as some. Um, thank you, firstly, for the opportunity to be involved in this uh, program. It's, it's a real honour. I'm, I'm really grateful. Um, the, the, the plan with the talk is to discuss where I, I've come from, a few inspirational buildings um, that I've visited, um, and a few of my own houses or experimental works, as I like to think of them. Uh, then discuss uh, some common themes in our work, followed by a more detailed look at a, a project that's almost finished um, that encapsulates many of the themes of our practice, Anderson Architecture. Um, I, I studied architecture in, in Sydney at University of Technology and graduated in 96. Um, uh, the, the degree was a, a part-time course um, that required one day and, and one night of study over six years. Um, but importantly, uh, it allowed me to work for an architectural firm for four days a week during that, that period. Um, uh, we had many inspirational tutors um, such as James Grace uh, and, and maybe someone you've heard of called Glenn Merkett. Um, this part-time education allowed me to, to gain a, a great deal of experience uh, even before I'd graduated so um, I sort of jumped up through the ranks and, uh, and worked on some really notable projects um, such as uh, the Bruggen Concert Hall which you can see on the left there which is a, it, it's a, it's a concert hall uh, inside a former stables building that's about 200 years old that's now part of the conservatory of music. It was a concert hall and then it was rebuilt completely um, well, we, we did keep some elements, but we, we for instance, interestingly, um, uh, took out the floor um, and, uh, and did an archaeological dig inside this, this space and found the old uh, uh, um, bakery um, that was part of um, the first colonisation of Sydney. Um, so during my studies after, after graduating, I, I worked for five architectural firms, um, mostly on commercial projects. Um, though the, the last firm I, I worked for was, was Kennedy Associates, where I gained uh, um, experience um, in sustainable residential architecture um, with, a, with a house on the, on the right there called the Clavelli House um, that won many awards. Um, I've searched back over my travels looking for three seminal buildings that uh, for me typify the architect's philosophy and, and are profoundly influential. The first is Louis Barrigan's own house and studio in Mexico City. Um, for, for my thesis as, at the end of the university I, I travelled to Mexico and, and visited Barrigan's works uh, including this house uh, and, and he has a, had an associated office next to the house. Um, the, the thesis, the the did I switch it off? Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Barrigan's work has been a powerful guiding force, opening my eyes to the use of natural light, form and colour. Uh, his use of tactile materials, um, textured render, exposed timber, glancing light, um, uh, and his monumental forms still, still captivate me. Um, after, after graduating from architecture school, uh, myself and two friends travelled through Europe um, in a VW combi van for six months. So we, we um, lived in this combi van and uh, would drive and camp in it. Um, and it got a bit much, I must say, by the end of six months in a van with two other blokes. But we, we did travel and see some amazing buildings. One of the most influential uh, was this Nordic pavilion in, at the Venice Biennale. Uh, it, it's an exceptional ethereal building um, for its use of natural light, um, but the mind-blowing element I that transcends the everyday is, is, is the way that um, nature in the form of three trees is incorporated into the building. Um, the heavy concrete beams float uh, with the use of light, uh, stopping and starting around the, the trees. 
Oops. Um, after after uh, being an architect on the Verbruggen Concert Hall, um, I, uh, w which I was involved with for most of its work on site, my wife gained a, a scholarship in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, that the fact that she's a scientist has sort of greatly influenced my experimental nature. While in Sweden, I applied for many jobs, but uh, with no luck, so I had plenty of time to study Scandinavian architecture. Um, on, on a side trip to Finland, we visited a number of Alvar Aalto buildings. Um, in preparing this talk, I rediscovered this project um, called his Experimental House, which I, I visited almost 20 years ago. Um, it struck me how I've been working is similar to, the, to Alto's philosophy with this, this house. Um, Alto built this house for himself and his wife to experiment on. Uh, he, he describes um, it, it as a place to crea it is created for serious experiments, particularly to tackle those problems that an architect does not, does not um, uh, have, have time to, to, to explore in, in uh, his day-to-day -day work. Um, it's, it's where a closest to nature prompts reflection on both form, forms and techniques. Um, this is how I feel about a number of my own homes that I'm about to show you. Um, this is the first house that uh, I renovated with my, my wife and brother. Uh, it took nine years for me to, to finish building mostly with my own hands. Um, it was during this time um, that we took a year off to live in Sweden. I believe some of the Scandinavian, Scandinavian way of life comes through in this house, uh, i.e. the sort of love of nature, a uh, humane twist on, on modernism with an emphasis on natural materials um, that give warmth to spaces, uh, an importance of natural light on the human psyche, to name a few. The concept uh, for the house was to reconnect with nature by having to cross the courtyard um, to, to, to go to the bathroom. So the, um, the toilet in the back uh, right corner here was the existing toilet. Um, we left that where it was and we just built a new bathroom around it uh, and then had a courtyard in between. So yeah, to use the bathroom you, you crossed outside um, Um, so it, it's a very small house as well. It's a terrace house, um, 50 square metres of site and 50 square metres of floor space. Uh, here is an image of the stair that I built up to the attic. Um, the stair and uh, house feature the use of black butt timber, a local hardwood uh, that's relatively plentiful and therefore uh, less impact on the, the local forests. The second picture shows the living space uh, with cast in sculptural backrest, um, uh, an experimental roof um, reminiscent of the Nordic Pavilion. Um, it has double layers of translucent sheeting above exposed beams, um, an experiment that was taken out after bugs found them, their way into between the layers of translucent sheeting. So not all, not all the experiments have, have worked in my and that's why I, I, I experiment on myself uh, and then the ones that do work take them onto clients. Uh, this is the, the attic. Um, the attic has an interesting side note. Uh, when, when I was working in the dark, dusty space, um, a loose brick uh, in the side wall, um, I pulled, pulled out a loose brick. Um, after the attic was finished, um, I, I left that brick out and we built a little window around it. You can see a little flap up the top where you can close the, the, the window off. Um, after the attic was finished, um, we were lying in bed one day and we noticed uh, what looked like clouds drifting across the opposite wall. Um, what had happened is that we'd inadvertently set up a perfect, the perfect conditions for a camera obscura um, so that the, the sky was projected um, on the opposite wall but upside down. Um, so in the front room of this house is where Anderson Architecture was born. Um, I lasted about six months working in that room by myself before I realised I needed to be around people. Um, so I moved to a, a share office in the bottom right hand corner there uh, and a, a Norwegian uh, student actually offered to work for me for free um, for th um, three months and, and that I was 
wow, I, I'm not sure I can take on anybody. I, I, uh, it was a bit nerve wracking, but um, that offer, um, I took the offer up uh, and then she ended up working for me for five years. I obviously paid her after the three months, but, and I've never taken on anyone since and not paid them, but it was this sort of breaking of the ice when someone says, I'll work for you for, for a, sh a small portion for free that, that I leapt at. Um, these, uh, th this is uh, the pictures of uh, the three studios that we've worked in since. Um, and I've been t you know, fortunate to work with many talented people. Apart from my own houses, all the projects we do are very much a collaboration with staff, consultants and clients. Uh, there, there are a number of themes that keep recurring in our work. Um, uh, with, with, uh, with experience and, and exper experimentation of my own terrace houses, uh, we gain more terrace houses to work on. Um, uh, terraces are a fantastic sustainable typology in my opinion. They're, they're compact, they, they share thermal mass um, through their party walls and, and they're incredibly adaptive. Um, with our second child on the way, we needed more space uh, and we bought a larger terrace up the road. <coughs> um, this is a picture of the, the kitchen. Um, this too has taken 10 years so far to own a build um, and it's still not finished. Uh, it has many sustainable experiments including hydronic floor heating um, that the plumber and I uh, connected to a solar hot water heater. So, so back in the, the day, um, 10 years ago, hydronic heating in Sydney wasn't very common. Um, so we, we experimented on it on this with this house. Um, the new concrete floor to the rear, it was the first time that we used green concrete as an exposed floor finish. Um, green concrete uh, has fly ash, recycled aggregate and c cement replacement compounds, meaning that one cubic metre of concrete saves a, one tonne of CO2 compared to normal concrete. Um, originally concrete companies didn't warrant use the use of green concrete as an exposed uh, finish um, due to the risk of colour variances um, from the recycled material. So I was the guinea pig to see what would happen if we used the, the, the concrete as an exposed finish. Uh, it was fine and we've used it on many projects since. Um, you can see another concept uh, in this photo that's common to our works where we pop out the side wall to sort of gain more light and space. Um, uh, the, the, this family room uh, opens onto a back deck, but it, it also has compressed fibre cement thermal mass wall linings to increase the thermal mass of, of, of the room. And, and it has a, an experimental idea, which is a, an underfloor series of buried terracotta pipes that, that cool air coming into the house. Um, Um, the, the attic um, also has a, a lot of recycled uh, material. The, the house is called the recycled house because of all of the, the recycled materials. Um, but um, possibly the more interesting aspect of the house is, is uh, its recycled water. Um, rainwater falls on the, the roof and is collected in 6,000 litres of storage in, in, in tanks in the, the Gabion rock wall that you can see. Um, the rainwater is fed to the dishwasher, one toilet, along with the bath and shower. The bath and shower water is directed to the reed bed that filters the water enough to come back into the house and use to, to wash our clothes and uh, flush another toilet. Uh, there is still mains water tapped to the kitchen um, but, but all up over the 10 years it's been running, we've averaged only 40 litres of water a day in total. Um, as a family of four, we use about 250 litres um, per, per week. Um, as, a, as a comparison, um, Sydney, the average Sydney home uses about 600 litres. Um, one of the challenges with terrace renovations is their access to natural light and vent ventilation while, while maintaining privacy. This is a, another house uh, of ours in Newtown that angled the, the upper floor walls to allow um, for views um, while restricting views from the neighbour.
the, the folding roof form is another um, you know work uh, started as a poetic idea and this this project um, um, trans it's a poetic idea of the wall transforming um, into the roof um, but the folding roof has another advantage in that it re reduces the building's bulk to the south um, in turn reducing overshadowing to the neighbors uh, we were able to show the authorities that the overshadowing from the, the, this uh, first floor was greatly reduced. This concept has gone on to be included in many of our projects. Um, this is one of the, the more famous of our projects. Um, it's called the Waverley House. Uh, the folding roof form developed um, on this house in the eastern suburbs. The, the roof opened, opens to the north but, but also incorporates a roof garden to the first floor. There are many other sustainable initiatives in the home, including a solar hydronic floor heating, double glazed thermally broken windows, 14,000 litres of uh, water storage, zero and low VOC finishes, to name a few. Uh, one, of the, one of the more interesting features was uh, a computer controlled system with thermo thermometers to each room. This allowed sun shading um, and electric windows to be automatically controlled Coupled with a weather station on the roof, um, the computer in the house could open the windows um, if the room was too hot uh, and the outside conditions were favourable. Uh, um, um, another part, uh, part of the computer system allowed the louvers on the western facade to automatic, automatically track the sun in winter time and then exclude the sun in, in summer time. Uh, winter light is, is allowed to enter through a grapevine covered roof garden. Uh, the sunlight was designed to, to hit the internal brick walls and re-radiate the heat through the day during winter. Uh, thermal mass is a, is a property of a material to... to um, sorry. The, the home utilises a reverse brick um, veneer walls. In other words, there are a steel and timber frame to the outside that is heavily insulated. Then the brick walls were built inside the envelope to add thermal mass. Um, thermal mass is a property of a material to enable it to store heat. This then provides inertia against temperature fluctuations. The higher the, the temperature the higher the thermal mass, the more heat storage and, and potentially also um, so, so, so masonry and concrete are ideal in terms of thermal mass. We've gone on to use more cost-effective thermal mass systems such as prefabricated walls that the concrete's poured into uh, with, with insulation to the outside that's also built in. Uh, in this house, both uh, the concrete in the walls uh, and the structural slab and the exposed floor were, were all green star concrete. Uh, the result is a, is a low cost, uh, insulated, highly insulated, high thermal mass wall that's structural, thin, acoustically solid and, and low in labour. So how do we, term, how do we determine uh, how much thermal mass is needed or, or the right balance of glazing and insulation, et cetera? Uh, we thermally model the project. Um, this gives us a, some objective scientific feedback uh, and a star rating out of 10 for each zone and, and the house itself. Um, we put the design into a computer thermal model um, by entering all, the, all of the building information, such as window types, orientation, shading, insulation, the program estimates the, the amount of energy required to keep the home comfortable. The higher the star rating, the less energy required. Uh, we don't slave, slavishly follow the results, but it provides uh, great feedback that we can balance with architectural aims. Uh, you can see in this, this renovation, the house itself scored 5.3 stars. Um, but the new living rooms are, uh, to the rear are ach achieving 8.8 .8 stars, which is fairly typical of renovations of old homes that we do. The, the, the old parts of the house are quite hard to, to re-insulate um, and often facing the wrong direction. Um, but, uh, but the new parts do well and, um, 
you know, that the, we greatly improve the, the livability of the house. The last project I'll show uh, is, is the third experimental house um, for me. Uh, um, we were fortunate enough to, to, to build ourselves, um, though this time around I learnt my lesson and employed a builder so that it doesn't take another 10 years to construct. Uh, we sought more money from the bank and bought a block of land in the Blue Mountains west of Sydney, which is about two hours from Sydney. We had a dream to, for many years to, to build an off-grid cabin um, that is self-sufficient as possible. The, the architectural concept um, for this is for it to be like a cave that shelters you from the elements. Uh, the, bo the, the, the block of land is a bush block with white gum trees to the lower half. Um, <coughs> it's, it's abundant in native animals uh, and a real escape from Sydney. Uh, the plan is split into two areas, um, with a living space to one end and bedrooms and bathrooms to the other end. An entry links the two halves. <coughs> to build it, we had to, to create a clearing around the house um, and take down a number of trees. Um, but a good proportion of the timber um, from the trees has been utilised in the construction of the home. Um, the, the two halves of the roof, uh, there, there are two halves um, of the roof facing different directions. The living room roof and ceiling open to the views and the cliff beyond, uh, allowing the solar panels on that roof to face the sun. Excess power from the panels is stored in a battery for use later on. Uh, we, we haven't had the money to, to buy a backup generator, but, um, but living with the power that you collect has been actually quite, uh, quite a reconnection of itself. Um, uh, and then we've learnt to, to, to put on the appliances when the sun's out to reduce the, the draw on the battery. While the site, the site is stunningly beautiful, it has many extremes and ways to bite you. Um, the area has extreme, an extreme bushfire threat. Um, it has furious termites um, that will start eating wood left on the ground within weeks. Just outside the house, uh, there are poisonous snakes and... and blood-sucking leeches, um, so <laughs> it can be trying. Um, and the temperature can reach minus six in wintertime and, and, and over 40 degrees in summertime. And, and just last week, for instance, it was four degrees in the morning and 26 degrees in the, the evening. So it, there's, there's great fluctuations. Again, this, uh, this project um, has been a way for us to, to learn about how to deal with the threat of bushfires, um, to tackle and maximise thermal mass um, and, and the use of prefabricated concrete walls um, were, were the bones of the house. Um, on top of that, fire out of windows and drop down sliding bushfire screens um, help to deal with the risk. Unfortunately, the house isn't quite finished, so. Uh, there aren't any professional photo photographs, but, but hopefully these pictures give you a feel for it. Um, there is a sliding perforated screen that protects one of, one of the, the, the facades from a bushfire threat, which is ember attack mainly, uh, and, a, and a screen, and, and also screens the hot western sun in summer. Uh, in the second photo, you can see some of the timber that was reused from the cut down trees uh, in the ceiling of the bathroom. The, the, the timbers can only be used on the inside due to bushfire and termite attack. And lastly, this is a picture of the living space um, with the doors slid back opening onto the deck. It, it shows the five tonnes of concrete facade that's um, perched on, on those black steel columns uh, and the opening corner window. Uh, the skylight to the corner provides an ethereal glow. Uh, it's, been a, it's been really rewarding to, to see how stable the, the temperatures inside the house have been. Um, so last week on that, that, that day where there was four degrees outside, it, it was 19 degrees inside with no additional heating, which was, was great to see the theory come, come to life. Um, so we hope from, from these sorts of projects that uh, they'll lead on to other homes that we can greatly reduce our um, impact on the environment um, and re reconnect with nature. Thank you.